and a half, we've been going through the book of Revelation chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And for some of you, you probably think, gosh, it's taken forever. But believe it or not, I've been speeding through it, just hitting the high points. Literally, you could probably spend five to six years on the book of Revelation. I've just learned over the uh, past 22 years in ministry that people really don't want to dig as deep as I think that they would like to. Uh, you don't realize this, but we went through the book of Ephesians verse by verse and it took three and a half years. Is that right? It took longer, five years. That's right. I thought it was five, but it took five years to get through the book of Ephesians verse by verse. And I think some of you who were with us back then, you're going, yeah, I don't remember five years. But anyways, so we've been going through this book and we've done it quite quickly. And some of you are thinking that, well, it's taken forever, but actually we're getting close to the end. In fact, we have finally arrived at the section that actually describes the return of Jesus Christ, and that's found in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 21. Now, last week we made it halfway through this section before we ran out of time. So tonight what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pick up where we left off. So turn in your Bible, if you would, to Revelation chapter 19. Let's pick it up in verse number 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Now, what most people don't realize is that there's going to be two great suppers at the eschaton. Now, does everyone know what the word eschaton means? The word eschaton actually comes from a Greek word. It's transliterated from that Greek word, which actually means last days or end times. In fact, our word eschatology is derived from that word also. Eschatology is the study of the end times. So at the eschaton, at the end of time, at the last days, there's going to be two great suppers. Now, we've already studied one of them. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. The other one is referred to as the great supper of God. Now, here's what's kind of interesting. We know that the saints are going to feast at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's going to be a time of celebration. But what most people don't realize is that the sinners will be the feast at the great supper of God. Because it's a time of judgment. That's why the angel is calling to the birds to come and gather together. The birds that he's calling are actually vultures. And he's calling them to come feed on those who are going to die at the battle of Armageddon. It's going to be a great feast for them. And that's why it's called the great supper of God. God is the one through Jesus Christ. That's going to actually slay all of the people. And we're going to find out who've taken the mark. And worship the image. And he's the one that's providing this great feast for all of the vultures. Verse number 18. Here's why he's calling to them together. That you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sat on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Now this is why he's calling the vultures, as I said, to eat the flesh of the kings, the captains, mighty men. And then he says, and all men, great and small. Now the phrase all men doesn't refer to everyone on the earth. It only refers to every person who's taken the mark of the beast and worshiped the image of the beast. You see, there are actually going to be survivors who make it through the tribulation. But it will only be those who didn't take the mark and didn't worship the beast, who haven't died or haven't been martyred during the tribulation. Those people will enter the millennium as mortals and their, I shouldn't say job, but one of the uh, opportunities they're going to have is to repopulate the earth. Turn to Isaiah chapter 65, verse number 20. No longer will babies die when only a few days old. No longer will adults die before they have lived a full life. Well, what is a full life? No longer will people be considered old at 100. Only the cursed will die that young. Now, of course, this is talking about the millennium. The thousand-year rule of Jesus Christ upon this earth. Now, during that time, children are going to be born. And people will live for hundreds of years, possibly even a thousand. In fact, the insinuation in the book of Isaiah is that these people who actually make it through the tribulation are going to live for the entire millennial period. And if someone does die, it will be prematurely. And it's only because they're considered to be wicked 
because they're cursed. But my point is this. Those who survive the tribulation are going to enter the millennial kingdom as mortals. And those mortal, mortals are going to repopulate the earth. Now, people, this is not science fiction. This is the word of God. Verse 19. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the world and their armies gathered together to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his army. And where do the armies of the beast gather together to fight the Lord? Do you remember? It's at Armageddon. If you remember, the Euphrates River is dried up, so all of the kings from the east and all of the kings from around the world, they come to do battle with the Lord. And the place that the Bible says in Revelation chapter 16 is that it's going to happen at a place called Armageddon. Now, Armageddon is the most famous of all battles and has not even been fought yet. That's kind of interesting. But if you mention Armageddon, it doesn't matter whether you've grown up in church or you haven't grown up in church. Everyone has heard of Armageddon. That's the battle at the end of time, the last days, when Jesus Christ returns. And it's amazing to me that it's the most famous battle of all times, yet it hasn't even been fought yet. But as I said last week, it's really not much of a battle because it's over almost as soon as it starts. In fact, we're going to go to verses 20 and 21, and you're going to see what I'm talking about. Look at verses 20 and 21. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with the brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. They were gluttons. Now, the outcome of this battle is never in doubt. That's why the angel is calling these vultures to come and gather before the battle even starts. That's what's kind of interesting. Before the battle even starts, this angel comes down and he starts calling the vultures, come to this great battle, I'm going to provide this feast. And it's called the Great Supper of God. In fact, what's kind of interesting is every time I read this, I can't help but laugh because really what God's doing is smack talking. Now, how many of you have ever heard of smack talking? If you played sports, you know what smack talking is. Smack talking is trash talking. You see it in football all the time. If a linebacker is on a blitz and he goes in and he sacks the quarterback, he stays on that quarterback for a while. And many times offensive linemen come and they try to push him off and the referee's got to come in. And as the linebacker is slowly getting off, he starts smack talking. Get used to it, pretty boy, because I'm going to be on you all four quarters. And you're going to be lucky if they don't have to carry you off on a stretcher because, buddy, you're going to see nothing but my number all night long. Now, people, that is smack talking. So what would, how, how would you define smack talking? Well, smack talking is telling your opponent what you're going to do to him in the near future. And that's what this angel is doing when he's calling the vultures to come and feast. The battle hasn't even started yet. And here's the angel of God, and he's smack-talking. Come and gather vultures for the great supper of God. And what's he telling him to do? There's going to be so many slain that you're going to be able to feast. God's going to provide so many dead bodies. And literally what he's saying is, suckers, you're going to die. So the outcome of the battle is never really in doubt. And the first thing that happens once the battle begins is the beast and the false prophet are captured. They're taken alive. Now, how do we know they're taken alive? Because they're thrown alive into the lake of fire. And that tells us that they're not killed, but they're captured. In fact, it's the Greek word zoe, which refers to physical life. They are physically taken alive and thrown into the lake of fire. Now, the lake of fire is not hell. People, hell is a temporary holding place. In fact, I'm always amazed at the number of Christians that don't know what happens to a person when they die. That always blows me away. And it always blows me away the number of preachers that don't know what happens to a person when they die. I'll go to funerals and I'll listen to a preacher who's giving a eulogy and he's mixing in a sermon. And as he's coming in, he's talking about hell as if it's the eternal destiny of a person. And people, you need to understand something. Hell is not the eternal destiny of a person. It's only a temporary holding place. It's where a person's soul goes if they don't accept Jesus Christ, but it is not their permanent destination. They are only there until they are resurrected. You see, it's not just Christians whose bodies are going to be resurrected. No! 
Even unbelievers are going to experience the resurrection. They are just resurrected at a different time. And as we're going through Revelation chapter 20 in about a week or two, you're going to see the second resurrection. You're going to see what takes place for the wicked. But here's what's interesting. Those who go to hell, they are there until they're resurrected to stand before God at what is known as the great white throne judgment. And then... They're thrown into the lake of fire, which is the eternal destiny of all unbelievers, all of those who've rejected Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Now, contrary to what some Christians have been taught, you don't burn up when you're thrown into the lake of fire. That is called the doctrine of annihilation. The doctrine of annihilation is a false doctrine. The Bible does not teach that. The truth of the matter is, if you are thrown into the lake of fire, you burn forever and ever. That's why preaching the gospel is such an important job. That's why God has called every Christian to present the gospel of Jesus Christ, to witness to their friends, their family, their neighbors, anyone and everyone you can. Because you don't burn up, contrary to what some people have been taught. Now, pastor, how do you know that? Well, jump ahead to Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, and I'll show you. It says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. In other words, this torment never stops. Now, someone says, well, pastor, that's only referring to the devil. It's not referring to people. Well, let's look this over. When the devil is thrown into the lake of fire, it's after the millennium. We're going to find out tonight that the devil is going to be locked up in a place called the abyss. And he's going to be there for a thousand years while Jesus Christ's kingdom has been set up on the earth. And that kingdom is going to last for a thousand years. After that thousand years, the devil is going to be let loose for a short period of time. We'll find out why when we get to that. But anyways, he's going to be let loose. And after that brief little rebellion, then the devil is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. But when does that happen? It happens after the millennium, after the thousand years. But as we've seen, the Antichrist and the false prophet are captured alive. And they are thrown into the lake of fire a thousand years before Satan. Now, I want you to notice what it says. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets prophet are. It doesn't say where the beast and the false prophet were. It says where they are. Present tense. So a thousand years later, the Antichrist and the false prophet, who were two mortal men, are still there. They did not burn up. No, they will burn forever and ever, just like you will if you do not accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, you need to understand something. When we talk about eternal life, we're using it in a specific way because the truth of the matter is every person has eternal life. The Bible just seems to refer to one as eternal death and the other as eternal life. Because death in the Jewish concept meant separation from God. But you need to understand that a person's soul was never created to die. A person's soul lives forever. It cannot be annihilated. Does that make sense? So what we find is that the false prophet and the Antichrist are thrown into the lake of fire alive before the millennium ever begins. A thousand years later, the devil... Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. It tells us he's thrown in the lake of fire where the Antichrist and the false prophet are present tense, not were past tense. Does that make sense? So the beast and the false prophet, they're captured and they're thrown alive into the lake of fire. They're not dead when they're thrown in. So they're the first two people to ever be thrown into the lake of fire. In fact, they're the first two of anyone to be thrown into the lake of fire. Everyone else who's rejected Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior are going to hell. Their resurrection will not be until after the thousand years, after that millennial period. 
And after that, then they are resurrected. They stand before God at the great white throne judgment. And at that point, they experience what is referred to as the second death. They are thrown into the lake of fire to be tormented day and night forever and ever. And lest some of you think that's not right, in about two weeks, maybe I'll get to it next week. Depends on how fast we go. I'm going to show you why that is. It's not because God wants that to happen. It's because that must happen. And I'm going to prove that to you in about a week, maybe two weeks. Now, look back at verse number 21. In the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So after the beast and the false prophet are captured and thrown to the lake of fire, everyone else who has the mark of the beast and who's worshipped the image are slain. Now, the interesting thing is they are not killed by conventional weapons. As I said last week, you know, we are really a non-combatant army. We're there with the Lord, and I always thought because I'd hear all these other ministers talk, but boy, we're going to come with Jesus, and we're going to just kill those wicked people. You know, and when you're young, you're like, yeah, that's what we're going to do. But the truth of the matter is, when you read through the book of Revelation, it's not much of a battle. And the only one that actually does any of the fighting is Jesus. And he really doesn't have to do much. He doesn't have this sword that he's holding in his hand. In fact, what it says is a sword comes out of his mouth and it slays everyone. And of course, the sword that comes out of his mouth is the word of God. So what this is basically telling us is that Jesus speaks the word. And they're slain. And they're not slain by conventional weapons. It's the word of God. And then to add insult to injury... These people aren't even buried. Instead, the vultures are allowed to eat their flesh. Now, why would God do that? Why would God at least have the decency to bury them? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because of the law of retribution. As we're going through the book of Revelation, what we found is that at this point, we're living in what is known as the dispensation of grace. Now, before Jesus Christ came, the people in the Old Testament lived during the dispensation of law. Then Jesus came, and we're living under the dispensation of grace. But once the tribulation starts, what is the dispensation? It's the dispensation of judgment. And that means the law of retribution. What you did is what you're going to be paid back. Exactly. Just the way it happened. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. All right? So, when the beast killed the two prophets, what did he refuse to do to the, and to, to the uh, two prophets? Do you remember the two prophets, Moses and Elijah? He refused to bury them. And all the world rejoiced that they were dead and that their body lay exposed in the streets for three and a half days. They actually sent messages to one another. They gave gifts. They were very, very happy. And they did not want the two prophets of God to be buried. So God does the very same thing to them. It's the law of retribution. I sent my people to call you to repent. And it's much like the parables that Jesus taught. And instead of receiving them and repenting, you not only killed them, but you left them in the street. And you rejoiced over this. And you allowed them to suffer the greatest indignation. So when God comes back, it's the law of retribution. Most of you don't understand this because we're living under the dispensation of grace. But it will not be that way during the tribulation. It is the law of retribution, and it's going to occur. Now, let's move on to chapter 20. Yay, we finished chapter 19. Boy, we're really moving. Verses 1 and 2. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on to the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. And he bound him a thousand years. Now, all of these events in chapters 19 and 20 are happening in chronological order. These are not interludes. Remember what interludes are. It's kind of like parenthetical information. But you can't put those things in the interludes in chronological order. But when you get to places that are not interludes, all of these things are happening in chronological order. So right after the battle of Armageddon, an angel comes down from heaven with the keys to the bottomless pit, which is also known as the abyss. Now, we need to understand something. The bottomless pit and the abyss are the very same thing. 
The reason sometimes we refer to it as the abyss is because the phrase bottomless pit is translated from the Greek word abusos. Now, the word abusos literally means without a bottom or no bottom. You see, it's a compound word. And compound words are made up of more than one word. In this case, it's made up of two words. The root word, busos, which means bottom. And when you add the, priv- the privative alpha to it, it means no bottom or without bottom. Now, let me kind of explain a little bit about grammar. A privative is just uh, usually a letter. And this is almost in every language. It's a letter that you add to a root word to change the term from a positive term to a negative term. I'll give you an example in English. A theist is a person who believes in God. An atheist is a person who doesn't believe in God. Where we got the word atheist is we took the word theist, which means someone who believes in God, and then we took the privative A and we placed it in front of the word. Now it means, because we're changing it from a positive term to a negative term, that this is a person who doesn't believe in God. So what happened is you have this word busos, which means bottom, and then you add the privative alpha to and it means no bottom or bottomless pit. And that's why we translate it as the bottomless pit. But our English word abyss is transliterated from this Greek word abusos. So the bottomless pit and the abyss are the very same thing. So as I'm going along, I have to remember to keep things consistent. Because I know that, and I realize a lot of people don't, and I'll just switch back and forth from the abyss to the bottomless pit. But just keep in your mind, it's the very same thing. Now, in biblical times, the Jews believed that the bottomless pit was a corridor that led to a special compartment in hell. You see, they believed that hell was actually divided into three compartments. If you're taking notes, write this down. The first compartment was known as Tartarus. It was a special place for the angels that had left their first estate before the flood occurred. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Now you need to understand something. The Bible was not originally written in English. It was written in Greek. So we had to translate it from Greek into English. But that's not a good translation. You see, the word hell... In this verse, is translated from the Greek word tartarao. Tartarao. Guess where we get the English word tartarus. But it's not the Greek word Hades. So the fallen angels, those who defected with Satan and left the first estate, are chained in a place called tartarus. That's the first compartment in hell, and that's what Jews believed. Then you have what is known as Hades. In the Old Testament, it's referred to as Sheo. So when you're reading through the Old Testament and you come to this, pl- this word called Sheo, it's referring to hell Now or Hades. Hades is divided into two parts, the place of torment and paradise. Now, what did Jesus refer to paradise as? Do you remember? The rich man and Lazarus? The bosom of Abraham. So what happened... When Jesus told his parables, he would talk about the rich man who didn't really have uh, his heart right with God. When he died, he went to the place of torment. But when Lazarus died, where did he go? He went to the place called paradise or also known as the bosom of Abraham. Now today, the bosom of Abraham is empty. Why is it empty? Because when Jesus Christ was resurrected, the book of Ephesians says that he took captivity captive. Now you need to understand that in the Old Testament, when a saint, someone who believed in God and believed that God was going to send the Messiah, when he died, his soul did not go to heaven. Why? Because no man can come into the Father except through Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And as a result of Jesus not dying for their sins, when Abraham died, when uh, all the other Old Testament saints died, when David died, they went to a place in Hades called the bosom of Abraham. It was a place of paradise. It was a place where they were comforted. But you could look over into the other place known as the place of torment, and there was a chasm between the two. Now, when Jesus Christ died for our sins, you need to understand that he spiritually died. If he went to heaven immediately, he never really died because died in the Jewish concept means to be separated from God. So if all Jesus did was, okay, he physically died and went immediately to heaven, he didn't die. His soul just went up to heaven. 
So that doesn't even make sense. When Jesus died for our sins, his soul went to hell. And he did not go to the bosom of Abraham. He went to the place of torment. Now, I told the thief on the cross that this day you'll be with me in paradise. Do you remember that? But actually, when you read it, because there is no punctuation in the original language, they didn't have enough room. So they just wrote it. It says, he said, I say unto you this day, you will be with me in paradise. He didn't mean that very day. What he meant is, I'm telling you today, you're going to be with me in paradise. And where was he referring to? The bosom of Abraham. But when Jesus died, number one, the thief went to the bosom of Abraham. But Jesus so went into the place of torment. And he had to pay for our sins. Now, everyone in the bosom of Abraham could look over this chasm and they could see it happen. And here Jesus is and he's having to pay for the sins and all of these horrible things are happening to him. But when all of the sins were paid for, God looked down into hell and saw a soul that never sinned. Leviticus 18, chapter 18, verse number 5 says, The man which doeth these things, referring to law, shall live. And so God could legally raise him from the dead. And so all of a sudden, his soul came alive when the last sin was paid. And when his soul came alive, he did something that no man has ever been able to do. He crossed over the chasm. He had the keys to hell. He literally was able to bust through the gates, and then he walks in, and he goes to the other side. I don't know if he levitates and moves over. I don't know how he does it, but he actually comes over. And then the scripture says that he preaches to those who were in captivity. Why did he preach to those in captivity? Because they can't go to heaven unless they receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So he preaches to those who are in captivity. Now, after he preaches to those who are in captivity, they now, when he's resurrected, it says he took captivity captive. He took them to heaven with him. So today, the bosom of Abraham is empty. But the place of torment is not. So if you die as a Christian... Your soul goes to heaven. But if you die as an unbeliever, your soul goes to hell, to Hades. So Hades is the second compartment in this place called hell. And the last compartment in hell is the abyss. The the abusos. This is where certain demons are kept. Turn to Luke chapter 8, verses 30 through 31. Jesus demanded, what is your name? Legion, he replied, for he was filled with many demons. The demons kept begging Jesus not to send them into the bottomless pit. Now again, this phrase bottomless pit here is translated from the Greek word abusos, the abyss. These demons did not want to be sent to the abyss, the bottomless pit. So think of the bottomless pit as this place where demons go. So this angel, right after the battle of Armageddon, and all of these dead people are here. Satan knows, oh no, the beast, the false prophet, they're captured and thrown alive in the lake of fire. All of their armies are dead. The only one left standing is who? Satan. This angel descends down. He's got a chain in one hand and he has the key to the bottomless pit. The key to the abyss. He takes hold of of, uh, Satan and he binds him with the chain. Now, some theologians claim... That this is impossible. Because they say that it's impossible for an iron chain to bind a spirit being. But I want you to notice that this does not say it's an iron chain. This says that it is a great chain. And we're told in other scriptures that spirit beings can be chained. In 2 Peter chapter 2 verse number 4. And in Jude uh, chapter 1 verse 6. There's only one chapter, so let's just say verse 6. We're told that the angels that have sinned and kept not their first estate are now reserved in chains. They're chained. And they're kept in chains, it says, until the great white throne judgment. So the devil's not just confined to the bottomless pit, but free to roam around. No. No. He's bound in chains and confined to the bottomless pit. The implication is he's either chained to a wall or something else that confines his movement in this place known as the bottomless pit. And then the pit is sealed, or first of all, it's locked, and then it's sealed. Look at verse number 3. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I'm not going to get to that tonight. But I want you to see something. 
After that, he must be set free. In the Greek, it says, it is necessary. Very interesting. Now, notice that once the devil is chained in the abyss, the abyss is locked and it's sealed. This is written in a way, when you study it in the original language, that emphasizes the fact that Satan cannot escape. He's chained in the abyss. The abyss is then locked. And then it's sealed. So for a thousand years, we are going to experience living on this earth without any satanic influence. There's not going to be any demons loose. The wicked have been gone. They've all been annihilated. The only one that's actually coming through as mortals and living on this place are those who survived the tribulation but did not take the mark. They did not worship the image. And they're going to repopulate the earth. Well, what about us? We now have immortal bodies. Because when the rapture occurs, our bodies are translated. Our soul is now rejoined to our body that was decaying in the ground. We are rejoined. And now we have the same type of body that Jesus had when he was resurrected. So when we come back with him, we are going to rule and reign. Who are we going to rule and reign? The mortals who live on the earth. Does that make sense? So the world is going to actually revert back to the way it was before Adam and Eve ever sinned. And next week, we're going to look at this thousand-year period known as the millennium. And we're also going to find out why it's necessary for the devil to be let loose. And I think it's going to answer quite a few questions that many of you have.